morning guys. Uh, so yesterday we started looking at electrical circuits, uh, specifically the types of circuits we're going to be looking at are direct current circuits, which means uh, the charges can only flow in one direction. Um, basically our circuits uh, consist of four particular elements. I just want to rehash some of the vocabulary with you uh, before we step into a little bit of new stuff. Uh, usually what we have here is a electrochemical cell. An electrochemical cell here, its job is to convert chemical energy into electrical energy. So basically we run a spontaneous chemical reaction as the chemicals transfer electrons. Uh, if you go into chemtrol, we'll actually learn some of those uh, redox processes that happen. But somehow, as the reactions themselves occur, they actually are able to generate some voltage for you. Uh, that itself is called the electrochemical cell. Usually a battery consists of multiple cells, uh, uh, one after the other. So usually the symbol for the battery here is going to be um, this. So just the one is called the electrochemical cell. Usually a battery is going to be many electrochemical cells. Uh, you can imagine this is like a double A battery here. The long line is always representing the positive side of the battery. The short line is representing the negative. Uh, evidently, when you look at, like, let's say, a 9-volt battery, both terminals are on the same side. They can engineer batteries uh, to have their leads on opposite sides, but at the end of the day, there should always be one side positive, one side negative. So that definitely is one component here. Uh, that one there supplies the voltage. More on that in a second. Uh, we know we need to have a complete circuit. Basically, charges need to flow in uh, one direction. Um, unfortunately, again, historically, we thought it was actually positive charges that were actually moving. So what we're going to do for a circuit diagram, you always want to keep things uh, perpendicular if you can. So I have just a wiring here going straight up to the right, straight down. Uh, this is going to be our conductor. That's going to be our second component. Conductors are typically made out of um, metals because metals happen to be um, really good at transferring charges. Uh, I would avoid using insulators because insulators tend to resist that flow there. So usually uh, something really conductive. Technically speaking, the conductor would have some resistance in itself, but usually it's really, really minimal. That's the second component here, just to complete the circuit. Uh, you know any time that the circuit is broken, if I don't have a complete way to get from positive to negative, I'm not going to move at all. Again, we have artificially, uh, unfortunately, we thought it was positive charges that moved. So we had defined an I, which is a conventional current. Again, more on this in a second. But we had defined a conventional current that flows positive to negative, when in reality, it's actually electrons that are negatively charged. What's happening here is the electrons are already lined up along the wire themselves, even before you hook up the battery. Once you complete the circuit, the electrons have some desire because they're being pushed by the battery. They want to get away from the negative end, and they're going to start moving. Um, sort of in this picture here counterclockwise. Uh, electrons, relatively speaking, they're actually not moving all that quickly through a circuit because they're actually already lined up. All they're doing is they're just pushing the person next to them. This electron pushes the person next to them, this electron pushes the ne person next to them. It's the signal that gets passed down and the electrons will gradually flow through the circuit. When you actually calculate the velocity of the electrons, it's actually not that big. So that's what electrons are realistically doing. It's essentially the opposite of what we're suggesting with conventional current. Uh, the third component here, you don't want to just have this circuit uh, because the conductor has too little resistance. What we're going to have here is going to be a load. The load here is just a fancy word for a resistor. This is typically the device that you're using. This load is going to convert that electrical energy that the electrons have as they flow, electrical energy into whatever you want. So if it's a light bulb, it converts it back into light energy. If it's a buzzer, it converts it into sound energy. This is actually for you to run your actual device. So the way that your load actually um, uh, converts uh, the energy back is how it actually powers uh, whatever device that you're trying to run. Uh, so that's called your load, or that's the resistance. Um, that's going to slow down the electrons, and that's going to keep uh, the electrons from flowing too quickly uh, from the battery at risk of uh, overheating. Uh, that's that third component. Technically, we only need these three components, but again, because we want to be environmentally conscious here, let's say this really is a light bulb here. Well, I don't need this light bulb here to constantly be on. I don't want it to be draining my battery when I don't need it. What we're going to do is we're going to add in a switch. Uh, switch, usually, uh, we have the symbol here. Uh, the switch really is like a door. Basically, in this case, the switch here is like the door that's closed. We say that the switch is in the closed position. And in the closed position, that means the circuit is on, because you see that this one here is actually complete. If I have an open door instead, so it's like I break the circuit there, an open switch here is essentially it's an off circuit. You've just turned off the lights there. All right? So I just want to rehash a little bit of this vocabulary for you here, and then I will step into a little bit of new stuff. Uh, specifically, we talked about yesterday, our electrochemical cells. So that's actually where the reactions are actually happening. Our electrochemical cells were supposed to be able to generate some true voltage called EMF. 
It was supposed to give you like, let's say this is a 1.5 battery. Uh, maybe the true voltage should have been 1.8 volts. This is the chemical reactions themselves as they combine, how much real voltage should they be able to get? Just like as the electrons flow through the load, as the electrons try to diffuse through the material of the battery, there's always going to be some resistance as well. So what we had said is if you take a multimeter and you actually measure what's the voltage difference across the terminals, so if I stick one meter here on the positive terminal, one meter on the negative terminal here, I'm actually going to find, I'm going to write it down here, the voltage of the terminal is actually, yes, it's based on the electrochemical cells that are generating the voltage, but I would have lost a little bit of the voltage. If you sort of recognize this part of the formula here, uh, we know from Ohm's law, whenever you take current times resistance, uh, that always gives you a voltage. This is saying as the charges try to pass its way through the bulkiness of the battery itself, we happen to lose some of that voltage. So therefore, the terminal voltage, the voltage across the terminals, the voltage across the positive and negative, is somewhat less than the true voltage uh, that the battery could have given you. Um, so that's just going to be taken as a given here. Typically, we're just going to be given the terminal voltage, and we can just use that, oh, it's a 1.5 volt battery or 9 volt battery, and just going to use that directly. That one there, uh, voltage, uh, just again introducing some uh, language for you again. Uh, for your voltage, uh, we can definitely say V. Uh, voltage is also called the potential. Uh, to be a little bit more complex here, voltage is actually a measure of the energy supplied um, to push the charge. So if you wanted just an expression for that here, the voltage is actually a measure of how much energy is given per, uh, per that charge. Um, so as the charges themselves, whether you think it's positive charges that go in conventional current or electrons that go uh, in the opposite direction here, the voltage is what's giving these charges as they pass by that motivation, that, that desire, and that push to actually uh, come out of the battery and travel through the rest of the circuit. Turns out as we look at some more circuits here, uh, of course, if you change the voltage itself, it's going to change how much energy these electrons uh, have as they travel out of the circuit. That's actually going to have impact on how many electrons want to flow out at any given time as well. So that's what voltage is. Careful, even though we call voltage potential, potential is different from something else called potential energy. So potential energy is a totally different concept. Um, I think of this uh, battery here as a parking lot. Inside the parking lot, there's a bunch of cars. And basically, because uh, the battery supplies this push, supplies the charge of some energy, uh, if you use the analogy of a slide, it actually takes the electrons up uh, to the top of the slide, and the electrons then have uh, some uh, ability as they flow through the rest of the circuit to come back downwards. The size of this potential difference is basically how much energy that I'm giving it, how tall this slide is. Once they reach the top of the slide, as they fall through whatever device, as they run into whatever resistors, yes, they're going to have to give off some of this voltage by the time they get back. By the time they get back to the bottom, they have to uh, be at the bottom of the slide ready to uh, take that voltage again. That's what we mean by voltage. Uh, again, just qualifying some of the terminology from yesterday here. Whenever we say I, I is actually referred to as a conventional current. Again, technically this one was incorrect because we thought it was positive charges. So conventional current, we thought it was actually positive charges. You can call them positrons if you want, so not protons. Protons are sort of stuck in the nuclei of the different atoms that make up the metal. But if I have the antiparticle of an electron, a positron, a positive charge uh, moves from, well, if it's positive, it's going to go from positive to negative. When in reality, we talked about uh, yesterday, the electrons are actually flowing in the opposite direction. Uh, the way to think about this conventional current here, I, I is actually a measure of the charge divided by the time. So if you imagine you're just sitting at one point uh, in the wiring, as this positive charge here seemingly flows past you, all you're going to do is you're going to count how many charges pass you by uh, per every second. So in some sense here, you can think of the current here as a flow of electric charge. If you have a bigger current, the charges actually move by you quicker. Uh, in the grand scheme of things here, this, that speed here is not overly big. Uh, usually maybe 25 meter per second, 50 meter per second, uh, nowhere near as quick as you're thinking. But it's just a signal because we are already lined up. I just push a person next to me, the person pushes the next to them. That signal gets transferred a lot faster than the electrons themselves actually flow. 
Um, so that's definitely one way of looking at it. It's the flow of charges. It's how fast uh, the charges can back, uh, pass by. That is the technical definition. Uh, as we look at some parallel circuits in today's lesson here, we're actually going to liken it as well to a certain number of cars that travel down a path. They might run into what's called a junction, which is like a turning point. Some cars go down one way, some cars go down the other way. We're going to see that the current splits off. So technically, even though we're going to use the analogy of, okay, yeah, current is uh, it's technically the speed at which the charges can flow past. Uh, the higher the amperes, the bigger the flow is going to be. But we're also going to switch over to, let's think about it as also number of charges that arrive at a junction point, And then let's divvy up. Oh, you went that way. The rest of you have to go this way. So just be careful of that as we get into that parallel circuit part. The last component I want to just rehash to you here is this resistance. Uh, this resistance here are... We had sort of um, used Ohm's law already. Ohm's law here was V equals IR. Uh, remember from yesterday's lesson here, uh, Ohm's law was actually started off being derived for the resistance. So if you imagine doing this experiment here, I just pulled out a picture of a resistor. Resistor come in many shapes, many sizes. We'll talk about the color codes in a second here. Uh, but let's just, just qualify this here. So resistance here, we can use a big R. Resistance, as the name suggests, this one here is the sort of difficulty for charges to flow. It's the thing that's trying to slow down these charges. Current was supposed to be traveling from uh, positive charges traveling from positive to negative, and yet as you add a resistor, it supplies a resistance and it slows down these charges. As you look at the Ohm's law formula here, you could actually do an experiment. I just want you to uh, picture doing a very simple experiment where we have a simple circuit where just like I did up above, you basically have a battery and just one single resistor. Let's start off here with just a single battery. Let's say it's a 1.5 volt battery. What I can do here is I can take, well, I know the battery was rated at 1.5 volts. I can take what's called the ammeter. We'll see this more in tomorrow's lesson. The ammeter will actually track the current for you. And what I can do is I can actually plot the voltage against the current. So again, let's see if we can place ourselves here. Uh, voltage is going to be whatever I've set for my battery. So maybe the terminal voltage is 1.5 volts. I'm going to find where it says 1.5. I'm going to look at the ammeter here. Because this is a complete circuit, the electrons would be flowing through. I'm going to have a certain current going through. Let me just make up a number here. Let's say 7.5, 15, 22.5. Because this is experimental here, there's no telling that it has to be spot on. But let's say when I put a 1.5 volt battery on, I realize that the current from my ammeter as it sort of gauges how many charges flow by, let's say the current itself is uh, 7.5. Technically speaking, just with that one single point, you could already solve the problem, well, how big this resistance is, because I know Ohm's law. However, experimentally, what you can do is you can, because this is an experiment, we can say, all right, that's one 1.5 volt battery. What if I hook up another 1.5 volt battery? So in total, I now have a 3 volt battery. Because now there's more of a voltage, now the slide is a little bit taller, as the charges pass by the battery, I'm actually supplying more energy for those charges to pass by. What I would imagine then is as you increase the voltage, this current here would also go up. So let's now have, we have a total of a 3 volt battery here. Uh, I just marked it off here. Uh, let's say 3, maybe it's a little over 15, right? There's always going to be a little bit of experimental errors, but so lo and behold, I'm just going to just keep plotting the points here. Let's plot one other point here. Uh, I'm going to hook up one other battery. We'll connect all these batteries in series so that in total, now we have a 4.5 volt battery. So all the sort of positive, negative, positive, negative, it's in that fashion there. We have a 4.5 volt battery. You're supplying more energy for the charges again. I would expect, again, the current to go up a little bit here. When I'm at a 4.5, let's say this one here ends up as a dot there. If you did this in terms of your experiment here, you're actually going to get a nice straight line fit. Uh, as usual here, we want to use a ruler here, do a best fit line. Uh, especially when you're doing it experimentally, it may or may not actually directly cost you the origin. It really should, right? If I have no voltage, zero voltage, it should be zero current. Nothing pushing the charges. Why should the charges move? But especially because this is experimental, there's a whole host of experiments. Uh, experimental problems, especially with the stuff here. The wires could be a little bit frayed. Uh, the batteries themselves may not be completely able to give you their um, designated voltages for you here. What we're doing in this case here is we're hoping sometimes uh, we may have overestimated, sometimes we may have underestimated. By taking a couple points here, we're hoping our best fit lines sort of average out some of those random errors, especially if there is a Y-intercept where I'm not expecting it. That's actually a source of systematic error. That's a source of maybe something is wrong uh, with your procedure. But if I now, in this case here, usually when we have a straight line, we like finding what's called the gradient or the slope. So I do a y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. What would I get is for my best fit line, choose two points that are easy to read on your graph. Maybe I didn't actually take that reading. 
But what would I get if I take a voltage, that's your rise, and I divide it by the current? Right? We know from the definition here, well, voltage divided by current is actually the resistance. That's actually how uh, Ohm's law had actually derived it. It's just for us, we had actually brought up this I up, so that way we got V because IR. Again, Ohm's law here is not all that hard. Uh, however, the thing you need to start uh, thinking about here is for Ohm's law, uh, we're doing V equals IR for each certain component individually. I can do an Ohm's law just for the battery. I can do an Ohm's law for just for this resistor. Of course, if I just have one load here, it's a little bit easier. But remember, the Ohm's law, this V equals IR relationship, applies to each circuit component uh, by itself. Just a little bit more on this resistance here. When we have all these fancy resistors, uh, we see that there's a conductor, a metal on both sides here. Uh, that part there is not the resistance. The resistance is mainly here. Um, how resistances are actually coded for you here is they typically have four colors. Sometimes they have three. Uh, usually for the resistor themselves, how do you know which side is up and which side is down? Right? They put them kind of mixed and matched here. Uh, sometimes for the resistor, they try to help you out where the resistor of the four colors that might show up, sometimes they try to show all four colors sort of on one end of the resistor. So you sort of know, okay, the top end is the close end. That's how I read this is the first line, second line, third line, fourth line. In this case here, I would actually look at the fourth line because the fourth line, let me just sketch this out for you. When you look at a resistor, uh, I'm expecting to have four lines. You'll see in a second why sometimes I have three. Uh, here's how you read it. Here's how the color codes uh, work out. The first line here, as you might imagine, is the first digit. It's telling you, uh, it's color coded for the digits zero through nine, so I know uh, what number is the beginning. Second line here, also not too hard. Well, second digit, first digit, second digit, right? Well, pretty easy so far, right? That gives me two significant figures there. For the third line, probably most important, the third line, where you might be thinking, oh, the third line is actually, oh, it's just the third digit, right? I read first digit, second digit, third digit. This one here actually refers to that sort of order of magnitude. It sort of refers to how many zeros, just like what we did in scientific notation, so number of zeros. So what we're going to have is we're going to have these resistances here. I'm going to definitely always know the first digit and second digit, but in case I may be, oh, just in the hundreds of ohms or millions of ohms here, it's this third one, whatever color it is, it doesn't tell me the actual digit uh, value for the third uh, position. It actually gives me how many zeros come afterwards. And last but not least here, the fourth line, which is sometimes non-existent. This is actually what tells you sort of up and down from your resistor. The fourth line is actually sort of uh, the manufacturer telling you uh, what um, precision this resistor was designed at. For this one here, it talks about the accuracy. It talks about sort of uh, how good you can believe in this resistance here. There's only three colors for this. That's why it's usually easy to tell this is the bottom side of the resistor. Um, what's going to happen here in terms of accuracy here, I'm going to give you those color codes first. For the accuracy, they're going to have a couple special colors. If it's a gold color, gold band, it means the accuracy is plus or minus 5%. Right? Uh, if the uh, ohms is only, let's say, 100 ohms, and you have an error of 5 ohms, that could be significant. But if I have a, um, let's say I have a 5 mega ohm resistor, 5 million ohms, uh, in that grand scheme of things here, maybe a 5% relative error is not as bad. But a gold here is relative plus or minus 5%. I can have a silver band here, which is actually a plus or minus 10%. The reason why I mentioned sometimes you're only given three lines is sometimes you actually have no band, the no band is actually uh, trying to tell you here it's plus or minus uh, probably bigger than 20%. So while you can still read the first numbers here, they're saying they're not really confident in how they made this uh, material. So if you look at these resistors, again, I just stole the picture here, uh, you can tell which one is the top and bottom. Just look for that gold band. It's the one that sort of really sticks out. That's the bottom of the resistor. And then you can start counting, well, the first band is brown, the second band, uh, band is b black, the third uh, band is brown. And you can actually use this color code that I'm going to give you to actually read uh, the resistances here. Uh, so let me give you the color codes for the other digits here. Uh, so we'll just go through here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Basically, it's color coded for every single digit by itself. Uh, I'm going to start off from 2. Nicely, what they've done for us is they know people typically know the rainbow. So if I go Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, uh, five is green, we have six, which is blue, seven is violet, so seven is purple. At least the middle part of the digits here just follow the colors of the rainbow. Well, we still have a couple digits to um, uh, also talk about. I can't use gold or silver because I already talked about the accuracy. What we've done here is we started here from black. Uh, black and then brown is going to be for the one. Then we have the rainbow. 
and then after violet we go over to the gray and the white. So they've tried to color code it, although they could have designed any system here um, uh, to match up the numbers, they tried to go from sort of the most destructive cases, right, the, the darkest of colors when they sort of destroy each other, uh, destructive interference, and they try to get more energetic over up into white light. White light is sort of a combination of all the colors, it's the highest energy light. So we have that, that color there. At this point here, we can then uh, take a look at some of these resistors. So, for example, let's take a look at this first one. The gold band tells me that's the fourth man. That tells me the accuracy of five. If I read this first resistance here, I'm reading here orange, white, orange. So we quote it here, orange is three, versage is three, white is going to be nine, three, nine. The next one here, actually I think that second, yeah, still an orange here. Uh, that one there is also an orange, so orange here is another three. Instead of this third line here being just a digit three, remember that third line is the number of zeros, it's order of magnitude, that actually means uh, 39,000 like that. And then there's a gold band, it says plus or minus 5%. Uh, this is a resistance, so this one here is measured in ohms. The bigger the ohms, the harder it is for currents to actually flow. So you can go through here and practice, see if you can identify these resistors. Uh, let me do one more with you here. So this one here, oh, the gold band is down here, that's the bottom. This one is going to be yellow, violet, and then black. Yellow is a 4. Uh, your violet, your purple is a 7. Your black is actually 0, so there's actually, no zeros af uh, there's actually no zeros afterwards. So this is a really small ohm resistor. Also a gold band here, plus or minus 5%. That's how you actually read the resistance bands. Uh, there are what's called variable resistors. Basically, it's designed in such a way that on the circuit, it just sits there. Uh, however, you can actually, there's a little dial that you can twist, and by twisting that dial here, you can actually increase the resistance without necessarily pulling out the resistor and swapping on another one with the correct read. Um, what does this resistance here depend on? How can I actually change resistance? Uh, obviously, when you look at these, in terms of size and shape here, they're roughly the same sort of bean-like shape here, but you'll notice some of them are actually a little bit wider, some of them may be ever so slightly a little bit uh, longer here, uh, engineers can actually play around with uh, those dimensions here to actually uh, talk about the resistance. So uh, just for some detail here, for your resistor, this resistance here, not only can you find it experimentally, figure this voltage over current, uh, the slope, the potential, the resistance is also given by what's called the resistivity. Some materials are just more resistive than others. It's going to depend on the length of the material. So let's use L. So how much uh, material is the charge is trying to travel through and then divide it by the cross-section area. So if you imagine me taking a cross-section, a cut of this resistor, I'm sort of looking at, uh, so this is the one end of the resistor. Uh, I'm looking at sort of, I'm over here and I'm looking at the inside of the resistor here. What I'm going to see is I'm going to see a circle. What this is saying is the total resistance that we get is uh, proportional to some constant. So this is resistivity. This one here depends on the material. We can choose to play around with uh, which material impedes more, uh, resists the charges more, but it is going to be affected by what's the length of the resistor, how long of the path is actually running through. So this one here is going to be the length. And then for the A, the A is actually the cross-section area here. If I cut that resistor in half, I'm not encouraging you to do that, but if I did that, what it turns out is it's uh, inversely proportional to the area. The area sort of, imagine this was like a water pipe here. If the diameter of this here was really wide, the charges here, water can flow through very easily. In this case here, the more narrow, the smaller the area, the smaller the area, the more resistance it's going to be. So just be careful with this formula here. The area is the cross-section, cross-sectional area. The bigger the area, the larger the tube, the larger the diameter, and therefore it can then flow freely. So hopefully that helps you clarify some of these terms, voltage, current, and resistance. Uh, for today's lesson here, I just want to introduce to you parallel circuits, and then tomorrow we'll put them back together with our series. Um, for a parallel circuit, as the name sort of suggests, we want to make a circuit that uh, has paths that are in parallel, has more than one path available for you. So what's going to happen here is we're going to start off with our battery. Uh, I can take a, let's say, a 9-volt battery here. Remember, for a circuit diagram, even though realistically your wiring may be coiled and twisted like that, that becomes really hard to read. For a circuit diagram, we want to keep everything 90 degrees if I can. So we'll just do a standard parallel circuit here. I'm going to have a battery. Out the positive end, we go perpendicular. But this time, it's actually going to have two pathways. So one pathway, so far that's a series circuit. Uh, we just did that here. But to introduce a parallel pathway, what I need to introduce here is a junction. 
I need to introduce a turning point, a point where the charges can actually split off. Some can go one way, some can go the other way. Uh, again, I'm going to keep my circuit diagram here fairly 90 degrees, so therefore I can read it a little bit easier. This one here shouldn't be that hard for you to tell. Okay, now the, these two resistors are in parallel. It's totally possible that parts of your circuit, oh, this part here is parallel, this part here is series. We just know in this case here it's parallel because we know the positive is a long line, negative is a short line. We, again, for conventional current, we think going from positive to negative. If the charges started flowing out the positive end, as they travel down the wire, there's no real way to turn off. There's nowhere to turn off until they hit this junction. As they hit this junction, this is like a turning off point. I can either turn uh, down to go down the first resistor, or I can continue on going forwards. So that's called a junction point. Some of them will decide to go the one way. Some of them will decide to go the other way. As they make their way through the load, maybe this is two light bulbs here, uh, this battery will be supplying power to both light bulbs. Um, and then by the time they make it back, they run into another junction where, hey, all the cars end up arriving here. At first, you might imagine, well, these cars that travel down this path, they might be able to turn up this way. In this case here, they can't because there's a bunch of charges already pushing the electrons in the opposite direction. They're just going to naturally work their way back towards the battery. So in this case here of a parallel circuit, uh, charges have multiple ways of moving, but in this case you see the charges have to take their choice. No charges will actually pass through both resistors. Either I take the path down one way or the path down the other way. Uh, let's put some numbers to this here. Uh, let's make this our 2 ohm resistor again. Let's make this our 3 ohm resistor. So remember resistance is sort of the roughness and the sort of resistance impedance to charge, the slowness of charge. First thing we're, we're going to see, kind of the significance of more in tomorrow's lesson, but first thing we're going to see is we have the battery that's ready to give these charges uh, energy, take them to the top of the slide. These charges here, by the time they're at the top of the slide, as they make their way to the junction, they have two ways to get back to the bottom of the slide. One way is a 2 ohm resistor, one way is a little bit easier, the other way is a little bit harder. So if you had a choice here, one way has less resistance, one way has more resistance, uh, using a construction yard analogy, let's say there's a rough patch, but there's not much of a detour here. This one here is a little bit more rough here. You would then say, okay, well, I'm going to decide to take the easier path. Why bother to take the harder path? Silly enough here, whenever we have these circuits here, no matter how drastic of difference these um, are in parallel, I could have even, I'm not going to do this, but I could have even made this 2 ohm, I could have made this like 3 million ohms, I could have made one path so much harder than the other one, there's always some silly people that say, you know, I'm the risk taker, I'm going to decide to go down that path, evidently I'm going to be traveling much slower down that path uh, than this one. So, just keep that in the back of your mind here, um, that's why I'm sort of using that analogy, yes, technically current is supposed to be the flow of charge, the speed at which charges uh, come through, uh, what we're going to introduce here to start analyzing the problem here is uh, another one of Kirchhoff's rules. So far we've seen Kirchhoff's voltage rule. Let's actually do that first. Kirchhoff's voltage rule or Kirchhoff's loop rule. Basically it says the sum of the voltages around any loop uh, must be zero. So this is sort of saying, well, if I was at the top of the side of the battery, no matter which path I take, no matter I take it down the 2 ohm battery path or the 3 ohm battery path here, I have to make sure I've used up all 9 volts before I get back. So in this case here, that actually gives you some information. For a parallel circuit, I'm actually able to use deliver my entire 9 volts. I gain the 9 volt through the battery. If the cars take down the easier path, they can use up all 9 volts for this resistance. Or those silly people that end up going to the 3 ohm battery, I can use all 9 volts here, convert it into whatever light energy that light bulb is using. In this sense here, it looks like, oh, it's magic. I only use the 9 volt battery and suddenly I'm getting 18 volts worth, right? It's powering both batteries. Well, not really true because electrons, like we mentioned, or these uh, positive charges that I'm thinking, the positive charge will only go through one resistor or the other resistor. None of these charges that make it through the 2 ohm will then backtrack and go through the 3 ohm as well. It's just in Kirchhoff's loop rule that says, well, for the charges that take path number one, it uses 9 volts. For those that take path number two, 9 volts. And now, as you may be imagining, oh, it's easy. We can then use V is equal to IR, right? Ohm's law. Remember, the trick with Ohm's law here is I can do Ohm's law on each circuit component by itself. I can do Ohm's law just here. I can do Ohm's law just there. This is one way of solving the problem using the loop rule. I can say, all right, let's find out how many cars actually made it down this way if I know I can use up 9 volts, that's the push, and I'm trying to travel through a rough patch of 2 ohms. So let's go down this first path here. I'm going to call this R1. I'm going to call this one here R2. Um, in this case here, the voltage is I'm going to use up 9 volts. 
the current, I don't know yet, so I, usually I don't know that. The resistance happens to be 2 ohms, however. Uh, I just move the 2 over there. Okay, great. The current is going to be 4.5 amperes. Remember, ampere is just the uh, unit for current. So technically, let's measure the speed going down this path here is 4.5. If I'm sitting at any point here uh, as an ammeter and I can track how many charges go by, it's the speed is 4.5. What about down R2? Well, R2 is actually going to be, I also have 9 volts worth of battery. I don't know my current going down that path, but this path here is a little bit more rough. Intuitively, you say it's a little bit harder. So three, uh, 9 divided by 3 just gives me coincidentally 3 amps again. So again, so far so good. Intu your intuition still works out. I travel faster down the easier path. I travel a little bit harder down the third path. Uh, one thing I do want to caution you here, also when you actually engineer this, it looks like trying to go down the other path here, it looks like I actually have to travel farther. But if you use that analogy of, wait a second, the electrons are already all lined up along the wire anyways. They're landed down both paths. As I transfer that signal, as I'm this one person pushing the person next to me, pushing the person next to me, this signal of pushing the person next to me here, it's really no difference, even though this one here seemingly has to travel more uh, wiring before it comes backwards. Unless I have what's called a uniform resistance wire, um, uh, we don't, even though it looks like it's more path, it's only more difficult just because of this 3 ohm, not because of the distance. In this case, here I'm going to introduce to you Kirchhoff's other rule. These are basically the only two rules that we need. Uh, for Kirchhoff's other rule here, Kirchhoff's, uh, we're going to call this Kirchhoff's junction rule. And we've already been sort of alluding to this here. Well, if I have this junction point, only we only use this rule here when there's a turning off point. Uh, if I have a junction and a turning off point, whatever cars don't go down one path, they have to go down the other path. So what this one here says is current, uh, Kirchhoff's junction rule, uh, the current into a junction equals the current leaving the junction. The electrons have to go somewhere. The electrons can't be like, I quit. I'm just going to sit here because they're always going to be bumped by the person behind them. So what Kirchhoff's junction rule says is we can find, well, what is the total current, right? The total current from the battery, all the cars coming out of the battery. Again, technically current is not number of cars, but we're just using that as an analogy. If the total number of cars coming out of the battery, we now run into a junction, some of them are going to go down path number one. I'm going to call that I1, going down resistance one, R1. Some of them are going to go down the other way, Whatever that doesn't go down one way has to go down the opposite way here. So I1 and I2 have to add up to end up giving you the total current as well. So that's what we get from Kirchhoff's junction rule as well. Um, in a similar fashion here, when the I1, yes, it's going to use up its voltage here, but the cars still are able to travel through the rough patch. The I1 here is going to be exactly the same. The I2 does make it, oh, these two are also coming into a junction. The I1 and I2 added up, they're going to join up together again, and this should be I total. So using this analogy of thinking of them as uh, actual number of cars here, you actually uh, get the correct interpretation where um, uh, the number of cars actually doesn't change. No matter how many resistances, no matter how many voltage that it loses here, the current is always the same. In fact, if you use uh, this junction rule here, uh, there's actually another way of solving the problem. So I did the first way already, 4.5 amps, 3 amps. Well, total then, uh, 4.5 plus 3 means the total current is supposed to be 7.5 amps. That's how many uh, charges decide to come out of the battery at this given time. Uh, I'm just going to show you a quick derivation here. How can we, uh, if I didn't know, perhaps I didn't know, um, actually, I probably would need to know the same information, but let me just give you method number two here. What we're going to actually apply is we're actually going to throw in Ohm's law again. Ohm's law always relates V is equal to IR. Because this is quoted in terms of current, I can solve it for I. The I is equal to voltage over resistance. We saw that with the slope earlier. So what this tells me here is the total voltage from the battery divided by the total resistance of the battery has to equal to V1 over R1 plus V2 over R2, right? So let's just match up our diagram here. So V total here is the 9 volt that comes straight from the battery. The total resistance here has to do with sort of the resistance through the battery itself. Uh, that has to equal to V1 over R1 and V2 uh, over R2. What was the relationship between V1? So, sorry, what was the relationship between V total, the voltage from the battery, V1, and V2. Well, it was in Kirchhoff's loop rule that says around any loop, if I gain 9 volts, by the time I get back, I have to be back down to zero. If this is 9 volts up, I better have used 9 volts. Sometimes they do say minus 9 volts because I have to take away that 9 volts, but at least by magnitude, it says 9 volts, I use up all 9 in voltage 1. Or, 
for the electrons that travel down the, the uh, harder pathway here, they also equally well use up 9 volts, and it's a little bit harder, so the current is a little bit lower. What we're saying here is the voltages are actually equal on both sides. I may have had a 9 volt battery, so I'm going to just factor out a 9 volt battery. 1 over R total has to equal to uh, these two are equal, so V total is equal to V1 is equal to V2. They're all 9 volts in this question. I can actually say, well, that would just be V. I'm going to pull out this V here, and I'm going to have a 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, which gives us our last formula here for parallel. The voltages actually drop out for a parallel circuit. If you want to swap out the combination of having a uh, R1 and R2 for a parallel, it's... Uh, 1 over R total, or the equivalent resistance is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Uh, if you uh, remember in series, um, the one was just, oh, I run through one more path, or I run through the other rough patch here. Obviously, I run into R1 and then R2. And just to give you one last uh, just trial of this one, and then we'll uh, pick it up from there tomorrow. Uh, let's do a battery here. Let's say I have a couple resistances here. Again, the path length, the path distance actually doesn't matter. Um, let's make this one here a 5 ohm, a 7 ohm. Actually, let's make the middle one, middle path here the hardest. And let's make this here a 7 ohm. Uh, this question here, sort of really standard problem. Well, I don't know the current or I don't know the voltage here. If I could somehow swap out this, these three resistors here, which happen to be in parallel, use this formula here. Careful, you have to go 1 over all the R's. That still gives you a number. That's still the reciprocal. So you still need to undo it by taking reciprocal one last time. If I can swap this out and I can just think of this circuit as a more simple circuit, let's say I have the voltage like this. If I would just want to swap it out with one equivalent resistance, how much total resistance would this resistor have to have so that it acts the same as having these three resistances in parallel? Once I have it in one resistor here, we can just do Ohm's law, V is equal to IR. We can find the current and we can go from there. So. Uh, let me just hint at how we're going to do that. To find the uh, R total, you can pause and you can try it out for yourself. 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Oh, I happen to have three paths, so it's also good to have another term here. 1 over R total, also called equivalent resistance, REQ. 1 over 5 plus 1 over 9. Lots of fractions. Don't bother doing like common denominator or anything like that. Just punch it in the calculator do it as decimals. 1 over 5 plus 1 over 9 plus 1 over 7. Again, that one there gives you Decimal here will be easier to work with, 0 0.454. If you did uh, convert that back into a fraction, um, sure, if you did a lot of math here, uh, that fraction here is actually 143 over 315. Just I want to remind you that itself is not the total resistance. This is still the reciprocal of the total resistance. I still need to take 1 over this number. I flip this fraction back over. The R total equivalent is actually just 2.2. So what this is saying here is having these three resistors in parallel, we had a 5, we had a 9, we had a 7, it all amounts. Having these three pathways, the cars that make it down the easy path don't have to travel down the really hard path. Some will travel the moderate path here. It's like overall, uh, the overall resistance has actually decreased. And this is actually a nice generalization. I'm just going to end off with this note here. Um, uh, adding more paths lowers the equivalent resistance which really shouldn't surprise you. Uh, if you were designing a city and you only had one street that took you around the city, it's going to be jammed up, lots of traffic. However, if you do a second branch, even if that road here is shorter and not as nice to look at, because some cars can be divvied off one way, some cars can be off the other way, uh, it's going to overall uh, be a little bit easier. So uh, you can keep practicing through some questions. I will pick it up from there tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Take care.